South Asia was the birthplace of Buddhism, originating from what is now Nepal and reaching to the heights of influence under Ashoka with the Mauryan Empire. However, both prior to this elevation and in the following centuries, there was a growing influence and size of the movement that shattered it into the numerous oppositional factions. Out of this cluster of groupings, Buddhism came to be thought of as two separate major traditions, the Northern Mahayana, or Greater Vehicle, and the Southern Theravada, or Way of the Elders. Some of the more sectarian proponents of Mahayana call Theravada Hinayana, or meaning lesser vehicle, a pejorative name for which they consider the lesser teaching. In this video, I will focus on the development of Theravada Buddhism, its major figures, and its eventual spread to become the major form of Buddhism found in Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Thailand, Cambodia, and Laos. The Buddhist movement retained its coherence until the so-called Second Council, around 300 BCE, a hundred years following the death, or Parinavana if you're a believer, of Siddhartha Gautama, the historical Buddha. At the Second Council, there appears to have been a split between the Stavira Nikaya, meaning sect of the elders, and a group of reformists who sought to tighten regulations on the Sangha or community of the monks, and the Mahasamgika, meaning the Great Sangha. It is posited that these two movements are the intellectual ancestors of Theravada and Mahayana, putting forward the Theravada as the more austere traditionalists, while the Mahayana are the more plural and liberal in the application of Buddhist religious law and traditions. The Stavira Nikaya, or ancestors of Theravada itself, was later riven with schisms over the issues of metaphysics. Two sects emerged over this split. On one side, there was the Sarvastivada, which translates roughly as the theory all exists, which upheld that all dharmas, or in this context, phenomena, exist throughout time, in the past, present, and future. What this translates to is an eternalist conception of time, which sees the past and future as equally real as the present moment. This position appears to have been articulated for how karmic actions could have consequences through time. The second side of this split was the Vibhajivada movement, meaning dividing, analyzing, and often translated as distinctionists. This group of disparate schools and thinkers rejected the Sarvastivada school doctrines and distinguished between the real as present and unreal as future and past. For the Vibhajivada, only this moment now and the unconditioned state of Nirvana can truly be said to exist. As these two traditions came down to us, it appears that the divide was not as neat as both groups contained many sub-traditions. The Sarvastivada were quite influential in its day and wrote a separate corpus of Abhidharma, which has survived. However, it is the Vibhajivada who would come to dominate in India. Around 250 BCE, 50 years following the Great Schism, Buddhism had been elevated under Ashoka to the imperial religion of the Mauryan Empire. However, Ashoka, much like Constantine the Great nearly 600 years later, would find himself the most politically important figure as a new convert to a religion fractured by internal doctrinal and dogmatic division. This led to a third Buddhist council, which supposedly occurred under the patronage of Ashoka. At this council, presided over by the elder monk, Magilaputaptisa, numerous sects and traditions were expunged, with the intention of purifying the Sangha and Buddhism more broadly. Interestingly, it was not only other Buddhists who were the targets of these purges, but also other religions, with one of the recommendations coming out of the meeting being the expulsion of 60,000 so-called Brahminic spies. The clear winner out of the council was the Vibhajavada sect, of whom Mogilaputatissa was a member. Mogilaputatissa was also credited with an early work called The Points of Controversy, which sets out an exegesis of Vibhajavada sect thought and ideas. This work is considered so important in Theravada Buddhism that it is included in the Abhidharma corpus, despite clearly being credited to someone over a century following the Buddha's death. One of the key outcomes of the Third Buddhist Council was that Ashoka and the Mauryan Empire elevated Buddhism, as defined by the Vibhajavada, above all other religions, as it stated that at this time he ceased providing financial support to other religious groups, such as the Jains, the Brahminical priests, and the Ajivaka. Beyond the consolidation of Buddhism internally, Ashoka also sponsored Buddhist missionaries who travelled into West Asia, through Central Asia, and the eastern parts of the Hellenic world, as well as to the south into Sri Lanka. 
In Central Asia, the missions had great success. The Indo-Greek king Menander I probably converted to Buddhism almost a th- century after the fateful Third Buddhist Council, and Greco-Buddhism was an influential, if small, current in Central Asian history. Although Buddhist missionaries made it to the Mediterranean, there is little evidence of success of their conversion mission. There is some very distant speculation that a group called the Therapeutae, a pre-monastic sect com- commented on by Philo of Alexander, may have been influenced by the Buddhists, and some graves found in Alexandria which have been argued to be of Buddhist origin. However, over time, a resurgent Zoroastrian Persia, Christianity, and eventually the spread of Islam spelled the end for this western branch of Buddhism. However, as Buddhism moved south, it found a new home in Sri Lanka. Supposedly, Ashoka's own son, Mahinda, who studied under Moggaliputatissa, and Ashoka's daughter, Sanghamitta, brought Buddhism to the island. The first recorded Buddhist iconography in Sri Lanka dates back to around the 1st century CE, with a growth of Buddha and Bodhisattva iconography found from the 3rd century onwards. It can be deduced from chronicles, the above-mentioned artworks, and Brahmi inscriptions found in caves associated with Buddhist groups that Buddhism grew to a position of dominance in Sri Lanka only over several centuries, as it was slowly embedded into Sri Lankan culture. Around the first century, it was in Sri Lanka that the Tipitaka was written down, the three so-called baskets of early Buddhist canon written in the Pali language with only a few exceptions of archaic works preserved primarily in Tibetan and Buddha- Chinese Buddhist canons, the earliest written Buddhist works are derived from the Mahavihara monastic complex, which was founded in one of ancient Sri Lanka's capitals of Anuradhapura. Sometime between the Third Council, 250 BCE, according to the members of the tradition, and 50 BCE, according to Etic scholars, the name Theravada came to be synonymous with the now dominant Vibhajivada. With its flourishing in Sri Lanka, we can now truly talk of the Theravada tradition of Buddhism. It is hard to speak purely in terms of generalities of Theravada Buddhism, but there is a few common traits amongst the many different practices which have a tendency to reoccur, and as such I will mention them here. In Theravada Buddhism, the historical Buddha, as in Siddhartha Gautama, is viewed as the most excellent of teachers and a role model for anyone seeking Nibbana, but it is not viewed as a divine or supernatural being who can assist us right now. The teachings that he left behind may guide us towards liberation, but beyond that it is up to us. What this means is that, generally speaking, Theravada Buddhism doesn't involve the worship of the many Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, as in future Buddhas who have delayed their ascension to help others en route to Buddhahood. However, to call Theravada Buddhism devoid of deities also neglects the many Indic gods which have been incorporated into ritual practice and folk worship. The Theravada sect, as a general rule, places more importance on the Sangha, or community of monks and nuns, compared to Mahayana Buddhist groups. I should note that almost all Buddhist communities esteem monks and their position regardless of sect. However, in Theravada, the division seems more prominent. The pursuit of Nibbana in this lifetime is purely the pursuit of the Sangha, with lay persons expected to contribute alms to the upkeep of the Sangha and its monasteries. This contribution was seen in a communal spirit, as in pushing a bright young star from amongst the village up in the world as well as perhaps contributing good karma, which would lead to potentially a better rebirth, and perhaps a shot at Nibbana in the next cycle of samsara. In Theravada Buddhism, the goal of the members of the Sangha is to aspire to become an arahant, a person who has eliminated all unwholesome roots which underlie the fetters, such as beliefs in self, doubt, and attachment to rites and rituals. In Theravada Buddhism, once one has attained this state, there is no backsliding, the Arahant will remain pure until death. Thus, this is a stage in Nibbana with residue, the life left in the body. The Arahant reaches complete detachment in the process of Parinavana, when the body, bodily components fall away and there is no continuation of the karmic cycle. Many of these views were expounded upon and developed by Buddha Goza, the leading intellectual and most famous classical Theravada theologian. Living sometime in the 5th century at the great monastery of Mahavihara, he wrote a work called the Visuddhimagga, The Path of Purification. This became the definitive and orthodox interpretation of Theravada Buddhism since around about the 12th century CE. 
Bortigoza is an interesting figure in his own right, and as such I will dedicate a later video specifically on him and his works. Theravada did not remain a monolithic tradition, and from the middle of the first millennium CE, several large Theravadan Buddhist sects had established themselves in Anura Dapura. This fracturing of the Sangha also mirrored a similar political condition in Sri Lanka, which from the 5th century onwards was divided. One sect, whom we know very little about, was called the Abhayagiri, and this thrived during this period. It appears that Abhayagiri were more eclectic and tolerant of the other strains of Buddhism compared to later Theravada practice. Mahayana teachings and doctrines also travelled across to Sri Lanka from mainland India in this period, to be expected with its close proximity. At Abhayagiri monasteries, Mahayana and Theravada teachings seem to have coexisted. By the 8th century, esoteric Buddhism in the form of Vajrayana practices was also flowering in Sri Lanka. However, this mingling between Theravada, Mahayana, and Vajrayana traditions would soon come to an end. In the 11th century CE, the king, Vijayabahu I, conquered Sri Lanka and set about purifying its religious life. Emulating the Dharma Raja ideal of Ashoka, he set about re establishing monasteries and stupas which had fallen into decline since the 5th century. To do this, Vijayabahu had to reach out to nearby Burma modern Myanmar, where he requested Buddhist texts and monks of the Theravada tradition to assist in this refounding effort. In the 12th century CE, the king Parakramabahu I lent his support to the Mahavihara sect, who were the oldest Theravada group in Sri Lanka and home of Buddha Goza and the compilation of the Pali Canon. With this, the other sects of Theravada, including the more eclectic and tolerant Abhayagiri, were extinguished, and the Mahavihara interpretation came to the fore. Hence, this is why the works of Buddha Goza are considered orthodox from the 12th century onwards in Theravada Buddhism. It is claimed that these reforms were brought about as the king saw the Sangha as corrupt and divided. This prefigures the monarchical role that reformers and other Theravadan nations, such as the Thai kings, have played in recent history. It also, however, shows the close relationship between monarchical power and religious legitimacy. Buddhism spread not only from India to Sri Lanka, but also to broader Southeast Asia, with Buddhism following in the footsteps of other Indian religious and philosophical movements which mirrored the trade currents from the subcontinent. Buddhism, in all its varieties, Mahayana, Theravada, and Vajrayana, flourished in Thailand, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, and into maritime Southeast Asia, Malaysia, and Indonesia. However, from the 7th century onwards, Buddhism declined on the Indian subcontinent. With the fragmentation of the Indian subcontinent following the collapse of the Guptas, waves of invasions from Turkic and Mongol groups, and increasing competition from Islam and Hinduism. This meant from the 10th century onwards, the shining light of Buddhist culture in South Asia was Sri Lanka. And as Theravada became more orthodox from the 12th century onwards, this particular interpretation was spread to places such as Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia. The complex patterns of cross-pollination and competition between differing brands of Buddhism, Hinduism, and Islam throughout Southeast Asia is, and of itself, an interesting tale, and I will examine it in a separate video. In the 19th century, Theravada Buddhism became entwined with both a modernization brought about by Westerners entering the movement, but also from a backlash against Western colonial and Christian missionary practices. The establishment of Western colonial states meant that the Theravada Buddhism had shifted from its privileged perch as the handmaiden to South and Southeast Asian kings, which was resented. This also, however, led to an opening up of practice, which put more focus on lay worshippers, such as the providing of broader access to meditative practices. This interaction was not only antagonistic, however. Two Westerners who joined Theravada Buddhism, Helen Blavatsky and Henry Steele Olcott, both of whom were founded as the Theosophical Society, converted to Theravada Buddhism and had an immense impact on the modern movement, particularly in Sri Lanka. Olcott a colonel in the Union Army during the US Civil War, travelled to Sri Lanka. From a Presbyterian background, he acted as an almost Theravada revivalist, injecting a new interpretation and direction into the faith. Part of his influence is that the way that many Westerners and Sri Lankans see their faith is through a more austere and less pluralistic understanding of Theravada, one cast in the mould of Olcott's Protestant ideals of coherence and rationalism.
This means that many traditional practices, such as the worships of gods and rituals for good luck, were condemned as superstitious and not part of true Theravada belief. Another extremely important character in the development of modern Theravada was Rama IV, also called King Mongkut, the Thai king during the middle of the 19th century. Formally ordained as a monk prior to ascension to the throne, he put in place a root and branch reform of the Thai Sangha, eliminating corruption and deviating practices. In doing this, Rama IV was throwing back to the reforming practices of Parakrambahu and soaring up the support of what true Theravada looked like, but also the legitimacy of the monarchy, who aspired to act as the true Dharma Raja. However, as an antidote to this sterile view of Theravada, I should note that the other side of the story, that within the Southern movement, there is his own esoteric branch, sometime called Tantric Theravada. The practice uses institutions such as the initiation by a guru, much like other Indic tantric practices. It also makes extensive use of rituals, alchemy, magic, amulets, and mantras, which are said to provide magic and supernatural powers to the devout believer. Despite its name, the tradition doesn't seem to have a direct link to the tantras of India, but it could have been influenced by the Abhaya Giri sects' connection with the Vajrayana and Mahayana. Furthermore, the tradition probably borrowed from traditional religions and practices throughout Southeast Asia, including the Mon Kingdom of modern-day Myanmar. It is possible it even has some connection with the Wiza, or wizards, occult magic practitioners who are present in Myanmar to this day. In Cambodia and Laos, Tantra Theravada was one of the main religious currents of the society, in its specific incarnation in these locations called Yoga Vachara. The practice flourished up until the 19th century, when reform movements in Thailand and Sri Lanka largely eliminated such esoteric practices, as previously mentioned. Although suppressed, the movement still has considerable influence on folk belief, and practices such as the use of protective tattoos, astrology, and belief in the magical power of forest monks are probably indicators of its continuing legacy. Buddhism and particularly Theravada Buddhism, remains deeply rooted in the national identity and psyche of the nations which it has touched, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Thailand in particular. One of the less savoury aspects of this has been when Theravada as identity collides with ethno-religious complexity on the ground. In all three cases, there are examples where Theravada Buddhism has been used as a tool for mobilisation against religious and ethnic minorities, whether they be Tamils in Sri Lanka, Rohingya in Myanmar, and Patani Malays in Thailand. This is not to suggest that Theravada actively promotes violence, but its long association with the state and the role of the monarch as Dhammaraja means that even Buddhism can find itself weaponized in identity politics and communal violence. Theravada has not stood still. It is a living religion and continues to develop and change to this day. Since the 19th century, Buddhism has come to the West where it has sought converts, and in the 1970s it formed a large part of the countercultural movement. However, with the 21st century, Theravada has found its place as another denomination in the increasingly crowded religious market of Western belief, an example of which is the Vipanasa movement, which has promoted mindfulness in the West since the 20th century. Furthermore, in Asia, there have been further refinements in the revivalist and reformist trend in Theravada Buddhism, with the Thai forest tradition of ascetics attempting to get back to what they perceive as the true and earliest teachings of the Buddha. Thus, Theravada, the great southern tradition of Buddhism, remains a vibrant and dynamic tradition which continues to develop through to this day.